Good afternoon. Good to see you all on a, what appears to be a, a summer afternoon, and we sincerely hope this summer lasts. Can I pray for us? Father, we thank you for this afternoon. We thank you that we can gather here together. We pray that you will bless the word and that your word, word will be received and it will bear fruit. We pray that in Jesus' name. I grew up on a farm uh, in the bushveld in South Africa on the foot of the mountain. And I can vividly remember as a young boy putting on my boots on a Saturday morning and summiting this mountain. It took me a couple of hours to get to the top. And then I would sit at the top and view over the bushveld and think about my future, think about deep things, uh, think about uh, what God has planned for me. Um, and ever since I've been a boy, I've been fascinated with mountains. Um, we, we lived in South Africa, we lived on the foot of a mountain, and weekends we would spend time with our mountain bikes on the mountain trails. My son and I explored trails, built trails. And then God called us to a country called Netherlands, Nederlande. Um, ironic, isn't it? And, um, but when I arrived here, um, I, I was quite excited because I looked on Google Maps and I found places in Hilversum called Boomberg. I went to cycle at Lagerfeuze and they asked me whether I've been to Hogefeuze. I've been searching. I have not found these places. <laughs> A couple of months after we arrived here, my son and I was lying on the bed one Saturday afternoon and I asked him, how are you doing? And he's saying, no, he said to me, no, it's really tough. It's really hard being here and there are no mountains. I want a mountain, I want adventure. And uh, we caught the first train to Switzerland and spent some time in the mountains there. Today I want to speak to you about a promise, a mountain, and a giant. A promise, a mountain, and a giant. And the text is Joshua 14, 6 to 15. And I would like to read it to you. Now the people of Judah approached Joshua at Gilal, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kezanite, said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God at Kadesh Barnea, about you and me, Joshua? I was 40 years old then, when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me to Kadesh Barnea to explore the land, and I brought him back a report according to my convictions. But my fellow Israelites who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt with fear. I, however, followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. So on that day Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever because you have followed the Lord your God wholeheartedly. Now then, just as the Lord has promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years since the time he said this to Moses while Israel moved about in the wilderness. So here I am today, 85 years old. I'm still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out, and I'm just as vigorous to go out into battle now as I was then. Now give me this country the, uh, that the Lord has promised me that day. You yourself heard then that the Anakites were there, and their cities were large and, forf uh, and fortified, but the Lord helping me, I will drive them out just as he said. Then Joshua blessed Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and gave him Hebron as his inheritance. So Joshua, so Hebron has belonged to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kizanite, ever since, because he followed God. Uh, the God of Israel wholeheartedly. 
Hebron used to be called Kina Arba, after Arba, who was the greatest among men, the Anakites. And then the land has rest from, from war. So the main character here is Caleb. By now, Caleb is 85 years old. And we'll take the opportunity to look at Caleb's journey today, which involves a promise, a mountain, and a giant. The text tells us that Caleb was the son of Jephunneh, a Kizanite. Now, the Kizanites were <coughs> uh, actually came from Esau and wasn't pure Israelites. So Caleb and his family were as assimilated into the Israelites. So he was not a pure Israelite. He became an Israelite. And the people of Israel, like the people of the Netherlands, accepted Caleb. And Caleb, Caleb became a leader. And today, thousands of years later, we read about Caleb that helped conquer uh, the, the, the land. The story begins in Numbers 13, becoming, uh, being a couple of years after God led the Israelites out of Egypt. They lived in the deserts. They've seen many miracles. So they were aware of the interaction and the saving power of God. Caleb initially was 40 years old and a prominent leader in the tribe of Judah. He was a prominent leader because God instructed Moses to choose leaders from each tribe to go out and to scout. When Moses sent them out to explore Canaan, he said, go through the Negev and into the hill country and see what the land is about. Come back, tell us about the people, tell us about the land, tell us whether there are fortified cities, Tell us about the, the, the quality of the soil. Bring some fruit back. Tell us whether there are mountains and hills, which tells us they had no clue as to what this prom promised land held in for them. So that's, that was the purpose why they've been sent out. So they went out. The city of Hebron, in, in particular, what captured their attention. It, it was an ancient wall, uh, a city about a thousand seven, built 1700 uh, BC, um, and it was a prominent city. Um, so they came up back with a report about everything we spoke about, plus Hebron and reports about Hebron. They came back and reported what they saw. They reported what they saw about the witnessed about the soil, good soil. They came back with grapes that they had to carry, big, large, fruitful grapes. They came back and reported about the fortified cities. They came back and reported about the giants, the Anakites. They were physically giants and descendants of giants, large people. That was the report they came back with. Was the report bad? It was a factual report. It was a CNN report. This is what happened. This is what we've observed. By nightfall, the negative assessment of the danger spread throughout the camp. And with it, the infectious fears of these tribal leaders. That night, all the people of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. Women were sobbing that their husbands would be killed in battle and their children left fatherless. By morning, the men were ready to rebel, to select another leader to take them back to Egypt. How's that? They were saved from Egypt. They saw the miracles of God. The, the inheritance was right in front of them. They saw reality from a human perspective and reported that, which is called today the bad report. But there was Caleb. Caleb silenced the people, he was a leader, and said, we should go up and take possession of the land 
for we can certainly do that. But the men who had gone up before him said, we can't attack those people. They are strangers. And they are stronger than us. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report, Israelites a bad report and the land that they've explored. And, and the land that they've explored, they came back and said, the land and the people will devour us. All the people we saw were great in size. They were physical giants. We saw the Nephilim. Those were the giant people that walked um, and lived in Hebron. And interesting, they said the following words. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. My view of myself I portray on you and my perspective of your view on, my, on myself is based on that. I'm a grasshopper, therefore I think you think I'm a grasshopper. Very interesting thought. In, number four, in Numbers 14, Caleb states, the land we pass through and explore is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land and the land flowing with milk and honey, and he will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will swallow them up. The protection is, their protection is, go is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. And I'm reminded of the words of Joshua. When God called Joshua in Joshua 1, what did God say to Joshua? Be strong and courageous, I am with you. I think four times. Be strong and courageous, I am with you. Be strong and courageous, I am with you. Be strong and courageous, I am with you. Before he entered into new territory. I know there's people around here that are entering into new territory, other countries, new jobs. You've, you may have entered into this territory coming from another country. Be strong and courageous. I am with you. That was the message God gave to Joshua. Now Caleb turns around and, exp and, and, and actually lives out the courageous um, faith that God conveyed to, to Joshua was conveyed to Caleb. And notice the positive attitude. Notice the, notice the explicit mention of the Lord in his words. The spies came back and gave factual content. They just reported what they saw. What Caleb did is he had different, different spectacles on it. He looked through the lenses of faith into the circumstances with the big but, but the Lord, if the Lord is with us. So he had that faith to exemplify that. The unbelief which spread throughout the camp resulted in disunity, into rebellion, as the fear was based on unbelief. The Lord was angry, to, on, uh, ang angry with the people and vowed that none of their generation would ever enter the promised land except for Caleb and Joshua. Our inheritance is based on the fact that we need to have faith in what God has promised us. God and Caleb and Joshua were set apart. They are the, are the exe ex exemptions among the spies, demonstrating faith and willingness to obey. Obedience, faith, and courage. Those three things. Obedience, faith, and courage. In Numbers 14, 24, we read, But because my servant Caleb has a different spirit, 
and follow, follows me fully, I will bring him into the land he explored and his descendants will inherit it. A similar statement is found in Deuteronomy where Moses reminds the children of the rebels of God's promise, except Caleb. He will see the land and I will give him and his descendants the land he has set his feet on because he has followed the Lord fully. Deuteronomy 1.36 Caleb had a different spirit. He followed God wholeheartedly and that enabled him to inherit the promised land. His spiritual character was exposed when he consistently reported to the facts and fear. He exhibited obedience, faith, and courage. And his words that really inspires me is, if the Lord is pleased with us and give, us and give it to us, only do not rebel against the Lord and do not be afraid of the people. Interestingly, if the Lord is pleased with us, it was not a guarantee. It was an instruction to go out. And he went out. He had the faith in God and his word to go out. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will give us the land. Only do not rebel. What does it mean to rebel? All they did is gave the facts but did not apply faith to it. And that was contrary to, directly to God's instructions. Because what, what did God do? He promised Moses the land before they crossed the river. It said, this land you will inherit. Their response was, no, we will not inherit. We do not have the faith. We want to go back to security. We do not want to enter into the promise you have given to us. All of them, except for Joshua and Caleb, have perished in the situation where they were. Makes one think about the promises God has given us, the talent, talents he's given us, what lies ahead of us, and what is holding us back. What did Caleb say? Give me the mountain. And why is the, hill, the, the mountain, the hill country, so insignificant? Well, it's interesting if you read a bit back, if you read into Genesis, Genesis 12, God instructs Abraham to go to a country I will show you. What did he say? I will show you the country where you, where you go. Abraham left the land where he was born. He traveled almost 3,000 kilometers to this land. Interestingly, if you read Genesis there's no climax in Genesis. You can't make a movie out of Abraham's life because there's no epic end. He just carried on. He moved. And at a certain stage in Genesis, we read that he settled at the great oak trees of Mamre. Settled there. Where's Mamre? On the mountain, Hebrew. That's where Abraham lived. This promised land was occupied by these giants. Where does Caleb go? Every, all, everything else has been conquered except those hills. I want to go to the hill. I want to tackle that. I want to go to those giants. I want to slaughter the giants because God has instructed me to take the land. He chose Hebron. There's nothing in the word that refers to Hebron being given to him. It, it is what was left. And if, if you read some of the commentary of the scholars, they basically argue that Hebron was conquered initially uh, in Joshua 11 and 12, but it was reconquered by the giants and reoccupied it. And the Israelites were afraid of these giants. And what was the response of Caleb? Give me that mountain. Today, it's the burial place of Abram, Isaac, Jacob, Leah, were buried right there. He went back to the promises of God that was given to Abraham, was given to Joshua, and he took, took hold of that. So 
So what is the importance here of the promise, the mountain, and the giants? What did Caleb apply to his life to conquer these, the, the, the promise, the mountain, and the giants? He did four things. One, he applied God's word. What was God's word? God's word was, there's an inheritance. There's an inheritance that I want to give you. And God said, so firstly, God's word. The first thing he did is, what did God say? Question I want to ask you and myself, if we are confronted with the facts of life, the news app in the morning, the email we receive, what is our first response? What is our first response when we are opposed, when things turn against us, when we have self-doubt, when we feel like a grasshopper and we think other people see us as grasshoppers? God said. What did God say? What did God say to you? What are the promises he made to you? Secondly, what did Caleb do? I still try to figure out exactly. He's 85 years old. He's, he's saying, I'm still as strong as I was at 40. I'm vigorous. Was he? I don't know. I'm not sure he was. Because when Hebron was conquered, he actually sent his son-in-law to, to, to conquer Hebron at the end. He was supporting it. So physically may not, be, may not have been as strong as 40, but in his mind, in his faith, and his resolve, he was still as strong to take the land. And I'm reminded, um, uh, watched the uh, French Open finals the other day, and on the stadium it reads the words that I think it reads, victory goes to the most tenacious. Victory goes to the most tenacious. So Caleb was tenacious, <clears throat> he had courage, he had faith. But that's not where it stopped. His third point, he submitted that strength of character, strength of physically to God's word. He submitted it, if God wills. So I will use all my ability, if God wills then we'll succeed. And it reminds me <clears throat> of the word in the Sermon of the Mount that I've battled with. I never understood that. Blessed are the meek, because they will inherit the land. Blessed are the meek. What does meek mean? mean the Greek word of meek is prowess. <clears throat> what is prowess? The Greeks used the word prowess to break in a stallion. So what does that mean? That means power under control. Power under control. Caleb had the power, but he submitted his power under control. And what happened? He inherited the land. God has given us abilities. And it's for us to submit our abilities under his control so we can inherit the promises he's given us. <clears throat> then he was faithful, <clears throat> obedient, and he had courage to take on the promises of God. He understood the word of God. It translated into his heart, and that translated into action. So his mind, he heard it, he believed it, and he took action, those three things. So let us apply these principles in our lives <clears throat> with the promises God made, with the mountains in our lives, and the giants that we are facing.
a question I want to ask you and myself today. What are the promises God made to you? What do you dream about? What do you aspire to? What are your abilities? Because your dreams and your abilities are normally very close to each other. God's given you certain abilities. He gave Samson power and strength. He gave Paul a brilliant mind. He made David a good leader. Joshua had courage. God used that. They submitted that to him. But there's a promise over our lives that God has made and the territory we need to take to be able to cross that line and not to perish in the deserts of unbelief. And how do we express that? Through faith, obedience, and courage. Now, I would like to leave you with those thoughts. There's a promise, there's a mountain, and there's a giant. And then there's faith, obedience, and courage. Can I pray for us? <clears throat> Father, we thank you for promises. We thank you for mountains. And you, we thank you for giants that you've given us the ability through faith, obedience, and courage to conquer the giants, to summit the mountains, and to enter into your promises, Father. We thank you for your guidance. We pray that you will help us, lead us, and give us the strength to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.